morning, everyone. Uh, by now, this is a familiar chart to us, to you. Um, it indicates uh, the general revelation contained in the book of Revelation. We are in that section dealing with the tribulation, the seven-year period of trouble coming on the earth in the future. And uh, just a reminder of how this portion of Revelation is set up. Chapters 6 through 16 record the judgments that are coming on the earth in the future during the tribulation period. There are three sets of judgments, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. We believe the seals reveal what happens during the first three and a half years of, what, uh, of the tribulation, and the trumpets and the bowls describe what happens in the second half of that seven-year period. As you can see, there is not only a chronological progression in the judgments, but there is also supplementary revelation that is added uh, to help us appreciate what life is going to be like during that period. And we are in this last series of supplementary revelations before the bold judgments as we begin our study today in chapter 13. So if you'd like to turn there, this is where we'll begin our study this morning. Revelation chapter 13. Uh, here's another uh, overview of what we'll be looking at today. Chapters 13, 12 and 13 deal with Satan's activity during the Great Tribulation, <clears throat> the last three and a half years of uh, the Tribulation. Last week we looked at chapter 12 and saw the activity of Satan, who's described as a dragon there. Today we'll be looking at the activity of Satan's agents in that time. Then we will look at uh, supplementary revelation of preparation for the final judgments, the bold judgments in the Great Tribulation in chapters 14 and 15. So let's look at the first 10 verses, which describes one of the agents of Satan during the Great Tribulation. And the dragon, that is Satan, stood on the sea, sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his he horns were ten crowns, and on his heads were blasphemous names. <clears throat> Uh, John was in the island, on the island of Patmos when he received this revelation, an island in the Aegean Sea, a small island. And uh, undoubtedly when he went down to the seashore and looked out on the sea, he would see ships coming. If he looked west, he would see ships coming from Rome, Italy. And these would be hostile forces coming against the Greek Asia Minor, where he was. Um, and that's evidently how we are to understand what John saw here. Um, he's standing on the seashore and he's seeing something arise out of the sea like you would see a ship coming in, uh, over the horizon. And uh, this thing coming up from the west, we are told in other portions of scripture, is called the beast. Now we've already met the beast and he is called Antichrist by Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 and John in uh, 1 John 1. So this is the Antichrist who is coming up out of the sea. Now what's the sea um, symbolic of? Obviously this is not a water mon monster. This is symbolism. Um, the sea in the Old Testament typically refers to that which is chaotic. It is the, the realm of mankind in general. 
So um, from other scriptures, we can put together that what John sees is a man coming up out of a hostile environment toward him. And this person has ten horns, seven heads, and on his horns were ten crowns, and on his heads were blasphemous names. Now, uh, previously in the book of Daniel, we read the same description, but it is a description of a nation having seven heads and ten horns. In particular, you may remember from our studies in Daniel that uh, this is the last nation that is going to come to power in the end times. Here, it's described as a person. He is the head of the nation. So he is described in the same way. Ten horns refer to ten rulers. He's in charge of ten rulers. The seven heads, we know from Daniel, refer to seven nations. The ten crowns or diadems refer to the authority of the ten rulers. All this goes back to Daniel 2 and 7 primarily, though it's referred to elsewhere in the book of Daniel as well. So what we see here is uh, Antichrist coming up representing this last kingdom, which is going to be made up of ten rulers from seven nations, and uh, authority will be given to them. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, brutal, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Now we've read this description in Daniel as well, but there it referred to three nations. Remember, the leopard referred to Medo-Persia, the bear, referred to Persia, uh, rather the, the first one is Greece, the second one is Medo-Persia, the third one is Babylon. And evidently we're to conclude from this that this beast has all the power and the characteristics of all these former kingdoms, the kingdoms of Greece, which was swift and uh, wise in Alexander the Great. The Persians were a ponderous, brutal people. Uh, the Babylonians were like a lion in their ferocity. So he is to be like this. William Newell has written, the fact that the leopard of Greece, the bear of Medo Persia, and the lion of old Babylon, referred to in Daniel 7, are all seen in this beast, show how all-inclusive of human things will be his character. He sums up all the brutality, all of the massive ponderous of, ponderousness of power, all the absolute autocratic royal dominion of Babylon that the Gentiles have ever known. So he's going to head up a kingdom that is more powerful, more brutal, more subtle than any kingdom that has ever existed previously. If a race, uh, this is an interesting quotation by Will and Ariel Durant, who are secular historians. And uh, they've written many books on the history of the world. Uh, this is a quotation from their book, The Lessons of History in which they summarize their conclusions on the basis of their study of history. And one of the statements that they make in this book is this, if race or class war divides us into hostile camps, changing political argument into blind hate, one side or the other may overturn the hustings, the proceedings, we don't use that word much anymore, which it refers to the proceedings at an election, with the rule of the sword, if our economy of freedom fails to distribute wealth as ably 
as it has created it, the road to dictatorship will be open to any man who can persuasively promise security to all. And a martial government under whatever charming phrases will engulf the democratic world. That was written in the, in the 50s. It's interesting how much of that we're seeing today, isn't it? Not that we're in this last kingdom period, but certainly these characteristics are being uh, more and more obvious. Uh, this is another historian. He wrote in the 1700s. Note what he says, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. Will and Ariel Durant, the, the former quote, uh, authors of those quotes, uh, after a study of the history of civilization said that democracies are fairly short-lived and they are not the best form of government. Usually they concluded that monarchies are the best form of government. Depends on the monarch, of course, whether it's good for the people or bad for the people. But the Antichrist will have a monarchy. He will be a dictator. When Jesus Christ returns, he will set up a monarchy. It will be, he will be king of kings and lord of lords. And he will overcome every other one. But Alexander Tyler wrote, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves money from the public treasury. <laughs> from that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most money from the public treasury, with the result that democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy, always followed by dictatorship. That's sobering, isn't it? That is really sobering, written in the, in the 1700s by this uh, Scottish historian. Verse three, I saw one of the heads as if it had been fatally wounded and his fatal wound was healed. Now if the heads are nations, and this is uh, one of the nations under Antichrist's authority. Evidently, one of them is going to fail and then come back into existence. Later in this chapter, we'll read that Antichrist himself will fail, apparently, and then come back to life. So um, perhaps he is the one, the head in view here, too. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast because of this revival of life that takes place. They worshiped the dragon, Satan, because he gave his authority to the beast, Antichrist. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who is able to wage war with him? It's interesting that in the Old Testament, this phrase, Who is like often describes God. Who is like the Lord, the psalmist often said. Now there are people on the earth are saying this of Antichrist. See. By the way, Antichrist does not just mean this person is going to be against Christ. It means he is going to be a counterfeit Christ, a substitute Christ. And we'll see as we proceed through the description of his career, how apropos that is. Who is like the beast and who is able to war wage war with him? He seems invincible. A mouth was given to him speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. Blasphemies are words against God, um, ridiculing God, claiming to be God himself, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. 42 months being the equivalent of the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. 
that is, those who dwell in heaven. His uh, earthly dwelling place here is what's being referred to, I believe. It was also given to him to make war with the saints, the believers on earth, and to overcome them, and authority was given to him over every tribe, people, language, and nation. It's worldwide. Many people have tried to be worldwide dictators from the Roman emperors throughout history. Napoleon wanted to be, Hitler wanted to be, many other people wanted to be. Nobody has achieved that yet. But Antichrist will. All who live on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name was not written since the foundation of the world in the book of the of life of the Lamb who has been slaughtered. And believers will not worship him if they are faithful to the Lord. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. This is important, John says. It's interesting that that phrase occurs in chapters 2 and 3 very often, but it always says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here the churches are not in view, you see. I believe because the church will be in heaven, will be in heaven. But people living on the earth at this time will have this book and they need to pay attention to this. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. Now verse 10 is a word of encouragement for the believers, the saints on the earth who do not bow to the, the Antichrist. God is promising that if anyone, Antichrist or any of his followers, is destined for captivity by God, he will go to captivity. God is going to judge him. He's going to be punished. If anyone kills with the sword, and Antichrist will kill many with the sword, with the sword, he must be killed. God will balance the scales of justice. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. This is the basis for the perseverance, the faithful conduct of believers in view of what's coming. It is the assurance that God is going to make things right eventually. That's very comforting. And especially... It will be so for those at this time in history. My little clicker is slow to respond today. <laughs> now we turn to another beast, uh, another of Satan's agents d during the Great Tribulation. The beast from the earth, verse 11. And I saw another beast, the Greek word indicates another of the same kind, coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. Uh, the word earth here uh, is not a specific reference to the land of Palestine. It's a general reference to the earth in contrast to the sea. Some have concluded that this man will be a Jew and the Antichrist will be a Gentile because one comes up out of the sea, the mass of humanity. The other comes up out of the, the land, which is, uh, which is a translation that some translations have of this Greek word, but it's the typical word for earth. And the contrast is really between a foreigner and a native. The first beast will be coming up out of the sea. He will be a foreign person to those that he attacks. And uh, this person evidently will be a, a native born person, more like a typical man than the Antichrist who will evidently rise from the dead when he uh, uh, attains some, when, when he is uh, given some kind of fatal mark. 
And he had two horns like a lamb. He appears to be gentle like a lamb, but he has power. And he stood, he spoke as a dragon. His words are satanic. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who live in it worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. Going back to verse 3. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of the sky to the earth in the presence of people. Remember, Pharaoh's magicians could do that, not bring fire down, but they did magic, convince the people that they were uh, divine agents. And Elijah brought down fire from heaven. God will enable these, this man to do this as well. And he deceives those who live on the earth. Of course, Satan is called the great deceiver, and this man will serve him in that way. He will deceive those who living, live on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who live on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause all who do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Evidently, he will issue commands that they be put to death. So he would somehow empower this image to speak whether this is a robot or a clone or what it is remains to be seen. And he causes all, the small and the great, all classes of people, the rich and the poor, the free and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hands and on their foreheads. And he decrees that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has that mark either the name of the beast or the number of his name. So he's going to control buying and selling. He's going to have absolute control over the economy of the world. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, or a, the number of man, either translation, is right, and his number is 666. Uh, as you can imagine, there have been endless speculations about what this number signifies, and all kinds of people have been identified <laughs> already as the Antichrist. Basically, there are three ways that people have tried to understand the meaning of this number. The first is by gematria. Gematria is a system of uh, equating letters with numbers that was used by the Hebrews, the Greeks, and the Latins. Uh, for example, the word alpha, first letter in the Greek alphabet, was given the numeric value of one. Beta stood for two. They did not have numbers as we do today. They use letters in place of numbers. So if you substitute letters for numbers, you come up with a word or a name. And some have calculated the, the name of Antichrist this way. But interestingly, the way you work this is there are a lot of slippage and different ways that this can work out. Nero, Caligula, the Emperor Leo, uh, Leo the Emperor uh, Gregory the Great, Napoleon, Stalin, uh, Hitler have all been identified <laughs> using gematria. <laughs> so uh, I don't put much stock in it, frankly. A second way that uh, the number of the beast can be calculated is to take it as symbolic. Um, here his number is 666. In scripture, the number seven is often used to describe something perfect, a perfect work of God, 
like the creation was done in seven days. And three is often a number of completeness, like the Trinity, or a superlative. Uh, nothing more can be added. So 777 would be something absolutely perfect and godly. Six, however, is often descriptive of man. Man works for six days a week, for example. There are other examples of the use of six in connection with man in the Old Testament. But if 333 means perfection and 666 means man, this is the ultimate man, you see, the perfect man. He may be described this way, and this number may identify him that way. The third way to figure out who this is, is to wait <laughs> <laughs> for the future. <laughs> and uh, if you believe that the rapture will take place before the tribulation, like I do, uh, you probably won't know who the, who the Antichrist is before you leave this planet to meet the Lord. He will only emerge when he makes his covenant with Israel, allowing Israel to return to the promised land in peace. So I tend to think that uh, people in, who, are, who are living in Antichrist's day will be able to identify him, but I don't think that we can identify him by name uh, at our point in history. Now you'll notice in this whole passage that there is a duplication of the Trinity. God the Father is the one who is an authority, gives, a, gives direction to the Son, who is the executor of the Father's will. He carries out the will of the Father. The Holy Spirit is the one who glorifies the Son. Jesus said, he will glorify me in the Upper Room Discourse. Here we have a different trinity. We have Satan who gives the orders to Antichrist, the beast, and he carries them out. He is his agent. And the beast, who is also called the false prophet in other passages of scripture, is the one who glorifies the beast by making everybody on the earth fall down and worship his image. Like was done in Daniel chapter 2. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar made everybody, for, or four, rather, chapter 4, fall down and worship his image. So it's interesting that, 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 that uh, the Antichrist theme is very strong here. We can see how antagonistic um, Satan will be toward God at this time. Now, let's uh, talk about some application of this chapter. The assurance that God will execute justice should encourage us to persevere faithfully and to trust God during any period of intense opposition by unbelievers. Uh, this week I got a copy of uh, the magazine um, the Martyr Magazine, uh, what's it called? Voice of, the Voice of the Martyrs. Some of you subscribe to that too and we're reminded of the martyrs that are suffering in Nigeria right now. Uh, around the world people are being persecuted but it's nothing like it's going to be worldwide in the future. But uh, as people go through persecution, as we may have to go through persecution, uh, the assurance that God will execute justice. This is the basis of the perseverance of the saints. That should encourage us to remain faithful and trust God when we are persecuted by unbelievers. We are marginalized in our society to some extent, even now. But in the future, it will get much worse for our brothers and sisters at this time. Second, we need not fear the beast or being marked by him. Uh, I've encountered some Christians who are very stressed out about um, whether the beast is Putin or somebody else. 
Uh, he may be Putin, I, I don't know, but I don't think we can identify Putin as the Antichrist. Um, he looks like him. <laughs> <laughs> but if you believe that the, the rapture is the next event in the prophetic calendar, as I do, uh, we are not going to be touched by this man, and we won't even see who he is for sure on this earth. We may observe it from heaven, but we won't see it from the earth because we won't be here. We, we don't need to fear him. Uh, there's no reference to the United States in prophecy, but there are references to Western powers the Bible talks about powers from the west, the east, the north, and the south. It's not real specific about nations, but it gives directions. Obviously, the United States is in the west. The Antichrist will arise from the west, but whether he arises from the United States or not uh, remains to be seen. He may arise from Western Europe. Who knows? We should not waste time trying to identify Antichrist, but should concentrate on presenting Christ. Uh, one summer when I was a single student at, at Dallas Seminary, I spent a summer as an intern with Dr. J. Vernon McGee in his downtown church in Los Angeles. And Dr. McGee said, whenever I preach on Antichrist, I preach to a full church. When I preach on Christ, not so much. That's unfortunate, isn't it? But it's true to reality. People are interested in Antichrist, but we should be more interested in Christ than in Antichrist. In summary, these two chapters paint a picture of the Great Tribulation in which there finally exists one government, one religion, one economic system for the whole world. This will be a time of great persecution and martyrdom for believers in Christ. Rather than getting better and better, as post-millennialists believe, the world will get worse and worse before Jesus Christ's second coming. Postmillennialism is a view of the future that believes that we are now in the millennium, that the present age is the age referred to as the reign of Christ on the earth because he reigns through his people on the earth now. That view was very popular before World War I because things in the world seem to be getting better and better. We are making advances of all kinds in society. But when World War I came along, people began to wonder if this was really the millennium. <laughs> Things seemed to be getting worse and worse. And then World War II came along, and it pretty well knocked the stuffing out of the post-millennialists. It's interesting, though, that this view is on the rise today. And some people believe that things are going to get better and better. And of course, we see technological advance, and that kind of seduces us to think that uh, things are improving, things are getting better and better, but the nature of man hasn't improved one iota, and uh, things are really not getting better. And as we'll see when we get into chapter 20, the millennium is going to be a whole lot better than what we're going through now. Now this brings us to the next section of supplementary revelation, and this deals with preparations for the final judgments in the Great Tribulation. This is the last, this is the last series of judgment, the bold judgments. And this chapter answers two questions that the previous chapter raised. What becomes of those who refuse to receive the mark of the beast and are killed? There will be those who refuse to knuckle under, to 
Antichrist. What happens to them? And what happens to the beast and his servants? This is answered in verses 6 through 20. So we can break down uh, the first two parts of uh, chapter 14 this way. Verses 1 through 5 talk about the triumph of the 144,000 that we read about in chapter 7 that will be on the earth during the Great Tribulation. All of chapter 14, by the way, is proleptic. It is anticipating the future. It's not telling us what John saw next chronologically, but he's jumping ahead to see things that will happen later on in the future. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion. He sees Christ return to the earth. That's not actually going to happen chronologically until chapter 19. But that's what he sees here, and with him, 144,000 who had his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. Not that the 144,000 will be standing on the Mount of Olives. Jesus will be there, but his faithful followers will be on the earth at that time, probably in Israel. And I heard a voice from heaven. He moves in his vision now from earth to heaven heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and the sound of loud thunder and the voice which I heard was the sound of harpists playing on their harps. Powerful, awesome uh, voice, but beautiful as well. And they sang, this voice is the, apparently the joint voice, the choir of the martyrs who have gone into heaven. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders in heaven, and no one was able to learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. That is, this song will be unique in that the 144,000 are the only ones who can personally identify with it when it is sung. We, ha we used to sing a uh, a hymn uh, that was uh, uh, it was it was the testimony of a man who had been saved out of great sin, and whenever I sang that song, I really couldn't identify with it, you know, because I grew up in a Christian family. I've been a Christian as long as I can remember. I didn't wasn't saved out of great sin. Uh, that is a debauched life. Praise God. But uh, I couldn't identify with that song. I think the 144,000 will be, be able to identify with this song because it will reflect their own experience. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are celibate. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from mankind as first fruits to God and to the Lamb, and no lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Now, in some translations, the NIV, I believe, translates this as they are pure, which is an interpretation. The Greek word actually means celibate, which uh, raises the question, are these 144,000 going to be single men? Well, apparently, um, definitely they will be pure in the sense that they have kept themselves from being marked by the beast and worshiping him. Remember when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said that uh, in view of your present distress, I would give you some pastoral counsel that you remain single if you are single. They were facing a present distress in Corinth that uh, he advised they would be better off to face as single people than as married people. And it could be that these will be 144,000 single individuals. I'm not going to beat that drum too hard. 
I may be wrong about that, but uh, that's my take on it. I think probably they will be. You know, we, we can identify with these 144,000 because uh, we are witnesses in our day uh, as they will be in theirs. Um, and uh, their faithfulness to God, they are blameless in their conduct. That's an example for us. Now, many people want to serve God, but mainly as advisors. <laughs> <laughs> not as obedient servants. <laughs> we are called to be witnesses, <laughs> not, by the way, judges or lawyers, prosecutors, defendants. We are called to be witnesses for Christ. Someone has said, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And if you have been called, God can qualify you to be a faithful witness in your day, in our day, as he will these people in theirs. Now we have the four climactic, well, uh, the four climactic announcements are these. I've broken them down in verses 6 through 13. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven with an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Uh, I, I take it that this is the gospel of salvation that you and I preach. It is eternal in, the, in its significance that uh, Christ's death has atoned for the sins of humankind and all who believe in him can uh, receive forgiveness and eternal life. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Remember, this is proleptic. It's, it's anticipating this judgment. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Don't worship Antichrist or the dragon. Worship God, the true creator. Verse 8, and another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. This is the announcement of the fall of Babylon. The fall of Babylon is actually coming up in chapters 16 and 17, or 17 and 18. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. I've encountered some Christians, too, who are very concerned about how technology is advancing and how um, they're talking about putting microchips under people's skin on their hands so that we won't have to use credit cards anymore. We can just stick our hand under the reader and that will identify and do everything a credit card does. And they're, uh, they're afraid of this and uh, don't want to make, make sure that this never happens to them. I don't think we need to fear that friends, it may be that the technology will advance and that we'll get microchips under our hands. That doesn't mean we're going to be slaves of the beast. If the Lord comes first, we're going to be gone before that happens. That's my read on it anyway. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day and night those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. It's worshiping the beast, you see, that is the issue. Here is the perseverance of the saints. Here's another word of encouragement. At the very end of this statement, like 13, chapter 13, verse 10, 
Here is the basis of the perseverance, the faithfulness of the saints who command, keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. It's that uh, the truly faithful to the Lord, the ones who have put their trust in him, will, uh, will be blessed. So we need to keep his commandments. God promises a safe landing, not a calm passage. And uh, these believers will not have a calm passage, but they will have a safe landing, and uh, that will be our portion as well. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. <laughs> it's going to be a blessing to die in the Great Tribulation. <laughs> this is the second blessing we read in the book of Revelation. There are seven of them all together. Says the Spirit, So that they may rest from their labors, and their deeds follow with them. We are going to be rewarded for our works, the scriptures teach us, and uh, our works follow us just like the tin can on the back of a dog's tail follows him wherever he goes. And uh, that's going to be true of these believers as well. Uh, a preacher died and went to heaven and uh, he was disturbed when he looked around and saw how he was being rewarded and how other people were being rewarded. And he, he looked up St. Peter and he said, uh, I, I don't think I'm getting a fair deal here. Uh, I've observed this cab driver over here. He's a New York City cab driver. And he was uh, much more blessed than this preacher was. And the preacher said, uh, why, is, why is his reward better than mine? I've been a preacher. I've been a missionary. I've served the Lord all my life. What has he done? Well, Peter said, Here, here's, here's how we look at things, he said. When people listen to you preach, what did they do? He said, well, some of them listened, some of them slept. <laughs> and Peter said, uh, exactly. When people rode in this man's cab, nobody slept and many prayed. <laughs> That's why he got a better reward. <laughs> now, verse 14. Come on, come on, here we go. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand, and another angel came out of the temple, calling out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to, to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Jesus referred to this end time harvest in his parables in Matthew 13 and in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. In John chapter 6, 22, he said, all judgment has been committed by the Father to the Son. So this may be Jesus Christ himself who is executing this judgment. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Whoosh. And uh, everybody gets what they deserve. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. Now, it says another angel here. So it may not be Christ in the first instance, 
may be an angel. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. Now some expositors have seen this as a judgment of Israel, which is often pictured in the Old Testament as a vine, and the first judgment of wheat as judgment of non-Jews, Gentiles. Um, others have seen it simply as a repetition of the same judgment in different terms for the sake of emphasis, like two witnesses assure the, the veracity of something, so a repetition of the judgment assures that the judgment will take place. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into a great wine, the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress wine press was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 100 and, uh, 1,600 stadia. I take it that blood is spattered on horses' bridles for a distance of 180 miles. This is going to be a huge battle. And we'll read about it further in chapter 19. This is descriptive of the Battle of Armageddon. Remember chapter 14, where we are, is looking ahead. So this is looking ahead to the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, it's about 180 miles from the Valley of Jezreel in the north of Israel, where most of this battle is apparently going to take place, to the, red, to the Dead Sea. So there can be a lot of bloodshed. It's interesting to read some of the ancient historians who talk about the destruction of cities in Roman times, and blood literally flowed in the streets. I mean, it was horrendous. And uh, in the future, this is going to be the worst bloodletting of all when God judges people who are his enemies all over the promised land, and this much blood is going to be shed. Now we go into chapter 15, which is the preparation for the bowl judgments. And I'll break this down into these sections. Then I saw another sign in heaven. He's looking at heaven now. Great and marvelous seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. So this is the announcement of the last judgments that are coming that we'll read about in chapter 16. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who were victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. We saw this sea of glass in chapter 5. It pictures the throne of God, uh, who is sovereign over all, who has subdued all of his enemies, and now the redeemed are in his presence. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Moses wrote two songs that are recorded in Scripture, one after the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. That may be the more parallel one here, since these people will have crossed this sea into God's presence. The song of the Lamb may be a song which the Lamb uh, gives them at this time. What, what it is, we have in verses 3 and 4. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God the Almighty. These are those who have gone into the Lord's presence, having been martyred or died in the great tribulation. They're singing praises to God. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. It's not Antichrist who is the King of the nations. It is God. Who will not fear you, God, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, not Antichrist. For all the nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. 
After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. The uh, tabernacle of testimony is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. This may be an allusion to God's faithfulness to his people in the heavenly temple that John saw. And the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple clothed in linen, clean and bright, and their chest wrapped with golden sashes. These are uh, angelic representatives of God who are going to take these bowls in hand and pour them out as the last judgments from God on the earth in the great tribulation. And one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Earlier we read that the, the bowls contained the prayers of the saints. So there's some connection here, you see, between God answering the prayers of the saints by pouring out his wrath in judgment on unbelievers. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So we have come now to the seventh trumpet judgment, which contains these seven bowl judgments. And as we begin next time, in chapter 16, we'll begin with the first bowl, which is in the last part of the Great Tribulation. So what? Well, first of all, in view of verses 9 through 11, we can count on the fact that eternal punishment is a reality. John Walford wrote, The doctrine of eternal punishment, though unpopular with liberal scholars and difficult to accept, it's even difficult for us to accept, isn't it? The, the idea that people who have rejected Jesus Christ will be punished eternally, that's hard. That's very hard. It is nevertheless clearly taught in the Bible. Jesus and the Apostle John say more on this subject than does all the rest of the Bible. <coughs> Second, people who die in the Lord are blessed. So we should not fear death. Those who die in the great tribulation will be in the Lord's presence immediately. Paul wrote that to depart from the body for us who live now is to be present with the Lord. It's a graduation, a commencement of a wonderful life that lies ahead. God will not pour out his wrath forever, however. Chapter 15, verse 1. Judgment is his, as Isaiah put it, in the authorized translation, the King James translation, his strange or unusual work. God does not delight in punishing and judging people. Well, why does he do it then? Because he loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son to lay down his life as a sacrifice and to die in our place. And for people to refuse that is the greatest insult to God that can possibly exist. That must be punished. That must be judged. That ought to affect the way we think about people. Father, you love us. You have sent your Son. You have given us the faith to believe in him. Give us the love for others that will share the gospel with them so that they do not experience your wrath and enter into a judgment that is going to be eternal. 
We thank you that your usual work is mercy, grace, kindness. And we have experienced that all of our lives. And we thank you and praise you as these tribulation saints will praise you in the future. We now praise you now. In our Savior's name, amen.